You ready? Yeah. There we go. Thank you. No. It's good. So it's the beginning of December and obviously Christmas is fast approaching. And on a freezing cold day, uh, my wife and I headed up to the city of Bath, which is in the southwest of England. And it's renowned for the beautiful architecture there, among other things. They have something like 5,000 listed buildings uh, and it's mostly Georgian architecture. So really unique city. It's got a lovely atmosphere. And as it's the approach to Christmas, they have an open air Christmas market. So there are stalls dotted around the city streets in the centre of the city. Well, we got so cold that we could barely feel our fingers, even though we were wearing gloves. And we came across this stall which was selling mulled wine and spiced apple juice. So it seemed like the perfect opportunity to grab a drink, which we did. Very, very nice apple juice they, they sold us. Um, and I took that little video clip because I thought, oh, that'll make a cool painting. So in terms of the painting itself, we're always, you know, thinking or convention says you paint the background first and then the foreground. But what I'm actually going to do today is reverse that and do the foreground first and then paint the background in afterwards. And I think for the particular technique I'm using today, which is basically impressionism with a combination of acrylic paint and watercolor, I think it works really well. And I personally feel there are some advantages to doing the background last, And but I'll get to that in a bit. So I've started out with my A2 mixed media paper. Um, I'm using interactive acrylics. This is burnt umber and a flat synthetic brush. I've sprayed the surface of the paper with water and that allows the paint to flow nice and freely across the surface of the paper. However, it's not as unpredictable as watercolour. So I think this is, a, this is a beautiful balance using interactive acrylics on a wet surface and fairly dilute paint. It gives you some of the expressiveness of watercolour, but you've got more control. So as you can see, I've started to block in uh, the person serving the mulled wine. Just put in the canopy and blocked in the torso, the head. We've got these columns of red cups, columns of red cups. Sorry, the voice is obviously a bit... Um, still suffering from the cold weather i guess so we've got these columns of red cups stacked in the bottom right corner and we've got a barrel full of the hot uh, drinks and now i'm moving on to some of the people who are crowding around this market stall notice the guy in the center of the reference who's got his back to us in the dark coat with the kind of winter hat on i'm going to ignore him completely instead i'm going to focus predominantly on the four people on the left side of the reference so just putting in the outline of the lady with light hair. She's got a blue and white striped top on. And she's carrying a bag. And the idea or, or the approach I take if I'm doing an impressionist style painting is, you know, I will do some line work, but even then I'm looking at the big shapes and what I would also call the essential shapes. So, for example, in order to communicate that the person on the right is in a market stall, I need to put in the canopy in some way. In terms of showing what they're selling, there needs to be a container for the drink. And then the columns of cups help to tell the story that something liquid is being you know, sold here. We've also got the beginnings of a billboard to the left of that barrel. Now we need to continue the story and show that some people are interested in buying this stuff. So as you can see, I've got the guy, the woman, just added some of the guy with a woolly hat on and I'm putting the lady in the bottom left corner just kind of peeking in out of frame because especially in a crowded situation like this things are rarely perfectly composed in real life so I could set those people up so that they're all kind of key players on a stage but that's not the reality of the situation that's not the feeling I get if I'm in a crowd the feeling I get is I can't really keep track of everyone and people keep popping in and out of my peripheral vision. So having established the main people that are going to be in this painting, I've now switched to some cadmium red. Just putting in, blocking in a bit of colour for 
some of these cups and putting a few more in the background as well. So now I'm starting to pick out key colourful details or key colourful shapes, which will hopefully start to enhance the story we're telling. So I haven't actually drawn or painted a single cup there. I've just painted the shape with curved edges and two straight edges of part of the cup. So I keep going with that red to block in the underside of the canopy. So I'm not overly concerned about matching the colours I'm using to reality. And then I'm not overly concerned about capturing the exact framework of this canopy either. I just need to put in some lines which will kind of give the impression that this canopy is being supported in some way. Now the lady bottom right has also got a red or orangey red top on so may as well carry on with this colour and block in some of her. And then aiming to be reasonably efficient just taking some of that red and mixing in some cad yellow. So now I've got kind of an orangey brown which is suitable for the guy's woolly hat. And then having painted that in, I can think, well, where am I going to go next with that colour? And I decide not to bother. Instead, let's add some tinting white and just use a lighter version of that colour. And we can use uh, some of that for some of the kind of shadow tones on the face of this guy who's standing slightly nearer the, the market stall. And I can use the flat brush to kind of sculpt out the silhouette or the profile of his face. Do something similar with this lady here. So I'm not really drawing a face. I'm just trying to look at the general shapes, think about the contours. And the idea of impressionism, as you probably know, is that the kind of combination of key shapes will combine to give the overall illusion that a person is standing there. Now, having added a colour to one side of the painting, I then typically think, well, do I need to add it to the other side to balance things out a little bit? So, for example, a little bit of dry brush on the side of this barrel added to or added over the top of a burnt umber curved bands of colour that we had. It's enough to kind of begin to describe the structure of that barrel. So a bit of white with a bit of magenta now. And I'm using this to block in the torso of that chap there. And then we'll add a couple of touches of that same colour on the other side of the painting, hinting at different objects that might be hanging from a hook or different parts of the structure of, um, of, of the market stall. Here I'm just putting in the little, those two strokes towards the bottom of the paper that I did a few seconds ago. They're meant to indicate a little bit of the card machine that the person's using to you know, allow people to pay. And I've just blocked in some what could be gloves or hands and the hat as well. So all with the same colour. So the idea is you've got colour of the same shape, shapes of the same colour in multiple locations, fairly evenly distributed about the composition. So 
So over to ultramarine blue now. Again, still a fairly fluid mix. I'm keeping my paint application nice and thin because that's going to allow me to put some texture down into the marks. So it's a very efficient way of doing things. So adding more white to the mix, so I get a, a slightly different blue now for this lady's top. But going to back to a darker colour for the, the bottom half of the top. Now I'm quite careful when I look at the stripes on a fabric because that white stripe which goes around her elbow and across her back. Getting the shape of that right is key to making it look like she's got an arm and a torso. So very, very important. So again, blue on the left. Let's add a little bit of blue on the right. So there is actually a second person manning the stall, um, but I'm more or less ignoring, well, I'm not more or less ignoring him. I am ignoring him. So I'm just putting in some abstract shapes bit of dry brush, a few fine lines, a few dabbed marks. Again, just to create a sense of movement and a bit of life. So the idea that there's some equipment back here, but we don't have to specify too much, you know, what that actually is. So using that blue as a shadow color now on that billboard. And then using it now to draw in the edge of the billboard and you know draw in the second barrel and then add in a little just a little hint of a second billboard as well so now so we've done two of the primaries we've done red and we've done blue so now let's go and do the yellow version of what we've just done Mixing it in with a little bit of the red and the... I jumped the gun there. Yeah, I'd forgotten what I did, actually. So I, I do put in some yellow, but I'm actually going more orangey, uh, first of all. Now, the lady's bag is uh, in the reference. I can't remember whether it's black or dark blue, but it's pretty dark anyway. And in my painting, I've got the guy with the woolly top um, in, with a blue top and the lady's got a blue top as well so I felt the need to break up that darkness of tone so that's why I mixed up the orangey brown because the oranginess is kind of complementary to the blue and what I'm doing here is I'm being inspired by the patterning on her bag and just in the same way as I mentioned before where you've got the white stripe going around her top that helps to describe the contours of her arm and back I'm doing something similar here with the patterning on the bag. It helps to describe the kind of roundness and weightiness of the bag. So it looks like it's full of shopping. Now I'm adding that same color, but a bit more of a dry brush technique to the front of the billboards. And then carrying that on to that second barrel. Now we're coming in with the yellow. So this is cad yellow. Bright burst of yellow for the blonde hair of the lady on the left. And the scarf or whatever it is um, that she's wearing. I think it is a scarf. And then some touches of yellow for the light bulbs that are underneath the underneath the canopy. Now, the approach I'm taking here is, as you, you know, you may have noticed, is very much colour based. There's not a huge amount of variation in tone. Obviously, there's some, but I'm, I'm not really picking out super dark shadows or going for super bright highlights. And the idea of this is that, as mentioned before, it, you know, it's almost an abstract arrangement of just shapes of colour. But my hope is that it, as a whole, it looks like a busy market scene with people standing around. So just balancing out the yellows in the composition now. So you can see with this technique, using the acrylic, 
you can block in very efficiently and quickly quite a lot. OK, so now I can move to the background. I'm just wetting the paper with clean water and now I'm going to come in with my watercolours. So this is um, some some violet out of the tube mixed in with a bit of blue from the pan. And so it's a, it's a wintry day. I'm exaggerating the colours. It was a pretty grey sky, but there was a hint of purple in the sky. Um, so I'm just sweeping in a, a nice clean watercolour wash to establish the sky in the background. And what I find is it's fairly easy to trickle a watercolour wash around the you know established figures that I've got there. I have let the acrylic dry for about half an hour, by the way. Um, and one of the reasons, so going back to my sort of key point for this video, you know, why paint the foreground first? Why not do the background first? Well, I kind of like doing the foreground first as well for a couple of different reasons. First of all, if convention says to do things one way in art, then I think it's a really healthy, creative thing to do to try and reverse that if only to find out the problems you might encounter by not doing it the conventional way. So typically I will learn something by going in the opposite direction. Equally, I may discover a new technique that I really like and is, is very powerful. But the reason I particularly like it for this style of painting is I'm taking the approach of painting what I feel is most important for the painting first. So for me, that's the people. And then having done that, I'm no longer too tempted to be overly influenced by my reference photo. And I now start to think, OK, where can I place the skyline and these buildings within my painting, which is going to enhance the composition that I've got? Because I want to create some kind of feeling that we're in the city of Bath. But I'm not interested in, you know, somebody being able to geotag it and say, oh, they were definitely standing right there. So I put in my um, my sky wash and that's still wet. I'm now coming in with what is mostly yellow ochre and sweeping in some silhouettes for the buildings. And the other reason I like it, I like doing the background last is I think it's easier to not go into too much detail with the background if you've already done the foreground. So sometimes when I'm painting a landscape or a cityscape, I put the background in and the temptation is very strong especially if I'm working from life, to look at the details in that background and put in a few. And it's often really the last thing you should do because you want the background to sink off into the distance to create the illusion of depth. So there should be much less, dis uh, much less detail compared to the foreground stuff. So what I find here is I kind of feel, well, I've done my foreground, I've done most of the work. What few touches do I just need to add to create a sense of space and an environment. And for me, um, I, I just really like the way it feels when I paint in this, this way, do things in that order. So I used a big round synthetic to put those washes in. I let them dry. And now I'm coming in with a mix of the, t of the violet and the building color. And I'm just going to add a few architectural details but the reason I'm using the brush I'm using is it's that fine line tree branch painting brush. So it goes to a very, very fine tip. And so what that allows me to do is just put in some very, you know, whispery, wispy, very fine lines. So the details I will add will hopefully be enough to make the shapes convince as Georgian buildings. But they won't be enough to detract from the bolder lines and the bolder shapes in the foreground. So to put it another way, by painting the background last, I know for sure I, the details that I add have to be fewer and less descriptive than what I've done in the foreground, if I want to create a, a sense of depth. The, the flip side of that is you could deliberately take the opposite approach to try and do something visually interesting and say, well, actually, I'm going to make the background really detailed. 
and try and bring the background forward. And that, you know, maybe that's an idea for a future painting. So there are lots of, of chimneys and windows and things in this building on the right. But really, I'm just picking out the odd architectural detail, summarising it as simplified marks and where I can, including perspective lines um, with, you know, within those marks. Now, having added the buildings in and making use of some of the shapes that have naturally occurred with the, the, you know, the bottom of the wash, and I'm using where I've got that pale patch of colour, just going to pop in a, a head at the top of that and then use the top edge of that pale patch as the beginnings of a shoulder. So in the same way the buildings are creating a sense of depth, if I just put in a few sort of faint ghost-like figures in the background, and I say a few, I mean two probably. Here's the second one coming in now. And these can be reasonably confused as long as they look, you know, roughly figure-like. Again, it just pushes them off into the distance and helps create a sense of busyness and a sense of space within the painting. Now that said, the head of the guy on the right in the background that I've just painted, he's that's sort of disappearing into that darker area of wash. So I'm just coming in with my violet to just you know enhance the line work there. And then when I'm adding some letters to this sign in the foreground, I'm just hinting at the word organic, but quite deliberately not fully describing it because I don't nothing is particularly well defined in this painting and I don't want people's eye being too strongly drawn to the lettering in the foreground. So then the only other thing of worry at the moment is the hands of the person serving look a bit disconnected from the arms so just a couple of cuff lines in there and then that's pretty much done. My, so my favourite part of the painting is these three people towards the left side. I really like the guy in the woolly hat. I think he works really well. But then my absolute favourite bit is the woman here, because every time I look at this little group, even though I painted it, my brain kind of sees the guy in the woolly hat and then the guy with the blonde hair to his right. And then it takes a few seconds to kind of realise, oh, that kind of gap is actually her hair. And there is another person standing there. So I, I'm really, I really like paintings which have those kind of effects on me, where when I look at it, I don't see it exactly as it is immediately. And then it, for me, it kind of draws me into the scene. Anyway, hope you enjoyed this little video. Um, and I hope to see you next time. Thank you very much for watching.